Williamson County parents are speaking out about the LGBTQ plus pride flags in their children's classrooms. A Tennessee House member is arguing against military funded abortions. And we've got some more stories of discrimination against un Tennessee. All that and more on our podcast today. But happy Friday, you guys. Even if it hasn't been that happy of a Friday yet, it should be now because you've been graced with my presence. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Adelia Kirchner. I write for the Tennessee Conservative, and I'm filling in for Brandon this week, who is currently preparing for the Conservative Candidates Academy taking place in Chattanooga this Saturday. Um, there's a pretty good lineup of speakers, so I hope that all you potential candidates out there are taking full advantage of this opportunity. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our free daily newsletter. Just text NEWS to 423-205-5600 and follow us on the social media platforms where we have not yet been shadow banned. That's X, formerly known as Twitter, Gab, Getter, Truth, Rumble, and MeWe. Now let's get into our big seven for the week. Story number one. All right, our next story. A look at who funds. You got to be sure to go check out our buddy Steve Abramowich over at Mill Creek View Podcast Tennessee. Season one of Mill Creek View's CEO special is out now and can be viewed on YouTube, Rumble, and Instagram video, as well as wherever you listen to your podcasts. A new episode comes out every Monday at 9 a.m. where Steve interviews great American business owners doing good business. Steve also recently interviewed Alderman at Large, Gabrielle Hansen, who is also a candidate for Franklin City, Tennessee Mayor, and he just published interviews with Franklin Alderman at Large candidates Patrick George, Jeff Feldman, and Gary Moore. Also, if you're interested in getting caught up with Florida, Mill Creek View has a podcast hosted by Kat Stansel, and if you're interested in Washington State, they have a podcast hosted by Vincent Cavallari. But on to our next story. Williamson County parents speak out against displaying pride flags in classrooms. The most recent meeting of the Williamson County Board of Education was highly attended by many parents wishing to publicly speak out about pride flags in local classrooms. 30 parents signed up to speak at the meeting, leading the board to limit their allotted time to one minute each. The majority of those speaking were opposed to teachers displaying the pride flag. Bill Petty stated that the only flags that should be in the classrooms are the American flag and the Tennessee state flag. He went on to read a policy created by another school district that states that the district's role is to teach students how to think, not what to think, thereby keeping classrooms as places of education, not indoctrination. He encouraged the board to consider a similar policy. Parent Lisa Church argued against the push for the flags, asking why in the world do we need to have a pride flag in the classroom to make kids feel like they're safe? Doesn't that mean that the teachers who don't choose to put up a pride flag are unsafe? Why do we have unsafe teachers in Williamson County? She continued, we do not need politics in the classroom. We do not need teachers pitted against each other because one chooses to have a flag and another one doesn't. Every teacher needs to make students feel safe. We do not need flags in the classroom. Elliot Franklin noted that the displaying of pride flags in the classroom could actually increase instances of bullying. One community member stated, in my opinion, when displayed in a classroom, a pride flag represents agreement with the idea that the public school classroom is an appropriate location for the sexualization of children. <laughs> now, we could have conversations all day long, you know, about the fact that, you know, Education kind of is indoctrination, no matter which way you swing it, it's just what are you indoctrinating kids with, right? But it just comes down to why are why are these teachers as grown adults not understanding the fact that they're in charge of other people's kids for the time that their kids are at school? Like it's not it's not like, oh, I'm teaching my kids and we're going to talk about this, and I'm going to decorate our house with pride flags. It's, oh, well, I have a bunch of other people's kids being sent into my care. 
Um, let me just decorate my classroom with pride flags, even though I live in an area where, you know, not everybody agrees with me and um, I might get some backlash for this and I might be overstepping my boundaries. It's like the rationale behind some of this stuff doesn't make any sense to me. It's like the story that we put out a couple of weeks ago um, about that one Tennessee teacher who like decorated his classroom with communist propaganda mock-ups of his face, um, which is just crazy to me. I'm like, do your own thing in the privacy of your own home. Decorate your man cave or your office at home or your garage or your bedroom or whatever with pride flags or communist propaganda posters of your face, whatever you want to do. But why are you doing it in a classroom where you're supposed to be teaching other people's kids? I don't know. Don't ask me. It will never make sense. Um, but <laughs> the other thing that I think is interesting about this is the idea that these teachers are putting up the pride flags to make the possibly, maybe now, maybe at some point in the future, LGBTQ plus students feel safe. Personally, as somebody who has spent plenty of time in the academic sphere, I was homeschooled, but I did go to university and college and stuff. And I've had plenty of time being in a classroom where it is clear that the professor is left-leaning and they don't hide it and they do single you out and they do all of that stuff. So personally, I'm thinking back to when I was in high school, I'm like, if I was a conservative high school student and I was going to public school and one of my teachers decorated their classroom with pride flags or even just had one up in the corner, I feel like that would make me uncomfortable. That would make me feel a little you know, unsafe. That would make me feel like if I had an issue with somebody else, I might not be able to talk to the specific teacher about that. Um, why can't these teachers just make their classroom a space for all of their students? It doesn't have to be that you, um, you know, make certain students feel more safe than other students because of whatever belief you have about how our country interacts with each other. So I, I don't know. It just, it's unnecessary. Putting up these flags in your classroom is stepping over some boundaries, if you ask me, and I don't, I don't understand the mental process, but whatever. Our next story, Clarksville wants exemption to state sunshine laws. Wonderful. Wonderful. We love it. We love lacks of transparency. Okay, on September 7th, the Clarksville City Council voted to ask the state legislature to exempt the council from sunshine laws. These laws ban elected government officials from holding closed-door meetings to discuss public issues. After very little discussion, the motion was passed with an 8-4 to four vote. Council member Karen Reynolds spoke in favor of seeking the permissions, saying that the laws regarding transparency are stifling. Council member Wallace Red thinks the laws should be applied equally to all legislative bodies in the state. Red said, I'd like to ask the state legislature to allow local governments to fall under the same sunshine laws and rules that they follow. They make the laws. We should have the same thing. There has been recent criticism of the state legislature because they are not made to follow the same open meetings laws as local governing bodies. The Court of Appeals decided in 2001 that the Open Meetings Act does not apply to the General Assembly because the legislature was created by the Constitution and was not the product of a legislative action. While floor sessions in the legislature and committee hearings are open for the public to attend, many other groups of lawmakers hold private meetings regularly. Both Republican and Democratic caucuses have been inconsistent over the years with whether or not they would allow the public to attend meetings. The director of the Free Speech Center at Middle Tennessee State University, Ken Paulson, said the move was counter to the principles of democracy, even though we are a republic, but it's fine. Um, he said, I've never heard of this kind of request to be exempt. If somehow this were actually to pass for the Clarksville City Council, wait for the following legislative session where every municipality in the state will ask for exemption from their least favorite state regulations. Yeah, he's probably not wrong about that one. But <laughs> realistically, okay, um, our local governments, our state governments, our you know federal government for sure is never going to be uh, completely transparent with we the people. Um, but 
they should be as close as darn possible. That's all I've got to say. And the fact that Clarksville is trying to, um, <laughs> is trying to do this and calling the laws regarding transparency stifling is crazy. So, uh, if you live in Clarksville, that's what your city council is doing. Just so you know. Um, but I'll throw it over to Brandon for a minute. Guys, listen here. Listen here. This thing does not run on, uh, on rainbows and buttercups. Like, we spend a lot of money. We do here at the Tennessee Conservative. Uh, on writing articles, spending money on social media, software applications. I have to travel occasionally. That's the only money I've ever taken. Uh, promoting things. It's just expensive. I would get nickeled and dimed to death. And our bank balance just stays where it is. It's never grown. Uh, it, it, we just got a kind of safety net in there, and I'll leave it all in there, okay? And that's it. We need your help. We need your help. Why do conservative, or rather, why do liberal corporations control uh, all the politics in our state on both the Republican and the Democrat side? Because conservative Christians sit at home with their wallet. That's why we only have one conservative media outlet. That's why you know, I kept wondering, why aren't there more conservative media outlets as I enter into my third year this October? Because conservatives don't give. we got to change that. Please do go to conservative, uh, tennesseeconservativenews.com slash support. And when you do, if you give any amount, any amount whatsoever, we will send you this Don't California My Tennessee bumper sticker. We will also send you this. Sorry, it's a double. Stop feeding the rhinos bumper sticker. We need to quit feeding those rhinos. They are fat and happy enough. If you get $50 or more, a recurring donation, which we desperately need. Those recurring donations are really what keep us afloat. We will send you this. I think we're going to go back to this one. Proud Tennessee Conservative Tumblr. And we will send you this Proud Tennessee Conservative Koozie. Both of which are made of space age materials. Uh, that are indestructible. They are, unless you do something to them. And that's on you. So go to TennesseeConservativeNews.com slash support and do donate and help us. You can also mail checks. Buddy, I'll take them. You can mail checks to P.O. Box 625. P.O. Box 625. The old mailbox has been a little light here lately. We could You could use a little, little kick in the pants financially. Uh, P.O. Box 625, Signal Mountain, Tennessee, 37377. That's Signal Mountain, Tennessee, 37377. P.O. Box 625. Okay. On with the show. And, by the way, if you have failed to get your hands on one of these, you need it. Man, I can... We've had tens of thousands of people download this puppy, and I'm excited about it. Rhino Report. Here it is. 2023, baby. It's got the worst. It's got the best. It's got a vote-by-vote, play-by-play. You need this. You need this in your community, especially if you're involved in patriot or grassroots groups. And there's also a link in there to this one, which is the 2022 Rhino Report. And in order to vote uh, with knowledge and not ignorance, you have to know what happened in the 2022 and the 2023 and later the 2024 uh, legislative cycle as you go to vote for your state reps and senators. And if you see that people are rhinos, you need to not vote for them. And you need to help whoever is running against them. That is my opinion. That is my First Amendment right as a journalist. Vote them out. All right, y'all. Next story is Tennessee House Representative Reagan wants the Pentagon to reverse abortion policies and end wokeness in the military. Tennessee State Representative John Reagan, who is a retired Air Force pilot, sent a letter to U.S. Senators Bill Haggerty and Marsha Blackburn urging them to support U.S. Senator Tommy Tuberville in blocking appointments to top military leadership posts and also asked them to remove wokeness from the military. Reagan's letter sent on September 11th backs elimination of military funding for travel and expenses for military members to obtain abortions and uses the Tennessee Constitution as support, as well as the U.S. Supreme Court decision in Dobbs to let states decide on abortion issues. The General Assembly outlawed abortion services, making only a narrow exception this year to deal with the health of the mother in dangerous pregnancies. Now, the whole military funding the travel and expenses for military members to obtain abortions, that... (laughs) 
military members. You mean women in the military, okay? It's just another instance where we are incentivizing women to kill their babies in order for them to work more. Regardless of what something like that does to the woman, regardless of what something like that does to the child inside of that woman, um, you know, it's fine as long as they can get back to work as quickly as possible. We've seen this with certain businesses um, being like, hey, if, if you as an employee of our wonderful business here, if you get pregnant, you know, I'm sure they would be like, if you, if you are somebody who is a pregnant person um, <laughs> and, and you, you know, we will fund your trip to go get an abortion so that you can come back to work for us as soon as possible and you don't have to go on maternity leave and we can just use you, um, you know, for all that you're worth and we don't care what that does to your mental health, to your spiritual health. We don't care about you as a woman or the child inside of you. That's what I hear every time I see something like this. But anyways, back to the story. Reagan argues in this letter that military members resent their tax dollars going toward elective abortions in violation of their personal religious beliefs and calls the Pentagon's arrogant directive another form of a worthless wokeism. In addition, he says that service members perceive the military policy as part of woke ultimatums, such as on-base drag queen shows and story hours, accommodations for transsexuals, despite religious objections, saying they are among the on onerous demands that waste resources, cripple morale, and hurt readiness. I mean, of course, he's totally right here. And I, I think what's what's ridiculous is that a lot of these military initiatives, the, the woke military initiatives, okay, whether it's on a federal level or a state level or whatever, they really do take away from military members' ability to just focus on their actual job. Um, instead, all these resources, all this time is being spent, all this energy is being put towards pushing these ideals that have nothing to do with our military being prepared to protect and fight for our country. Th that's, that's all I'm saying. I don't... <laughs> It is ridiculous, and uh, I think Representative Reagan is spot on here. But on to our next story. Tennessee Department of Children's Services spending $400 million on intake juvenile detention projects. The Department of Children's Services is embarking on more than $400 million worth of construction projects to handle children entering state custody and improve problematic detention centers. Six months after removing the last children from state offices because they had nowhere else to go, the department received approval to start work on an assessment center and two intake facilities, nine facilities in total, in the state's three grand divisions at a total cost of $88.3 million. The State Building Commission approved those product projects in addition to $333 million for a new Woodland Hills Youth Detention Center in Nashville and improvements at John S. Wilder Youth Detention Center in Fayette County, where reports of abuse by guards, riots, and poor living conditions have been rampant. A new Wilder Center also is to be built to house another 24 to 48 minors, potentially bringing its population up to nearly 170. In late 2022, lawmakers discussed the need for about 60 more beds at Wilder after a panel of juvenile judges testified that county detention facilities were full and the state's juvenile justice system was at near collapse. Children in state custody also were forced to stay in DCS offices for extended periods of time because of a shortage of foster care families and heavy workload. The last children were removed from Memphis offices in late March of this year. The Youth Law Center doesn't consider the expenditure for more security in beds at Woodland Hills and Wilder the best strategy. The organization put out a report in December of 2022 showing problems at detention facilities and pointing out that DCS needs to focus on families rather than facilities. Miller said, The department acknowledged a decade ago it needed to move from large prison settings to smaller facilities closer to children's homes and work more closely with families. Yet it seems to have shifted philosophies in favor of bigger detention facilities that create more problems by putting large groups of young people together. 
Moving on, though, to our last story of the day. This one's a little bit more encouraging than some of the ones that we have covered. Um, Tennessee woman uses past trauma as motivation to empower other women through gun ownership. In a glaring example of why a decent amount of women, liberal and conservative alike, are in favor of gun ownership, a woman in Williamson County has chosen to transform a childhood of abuse and rape into something positive. Kristen Benton now instructs other women in how to protect themselves, training them to properly shoot and safely carry a handgun, which is, as Benton jokes, not so easy if you want to wear cute clothes. The gun training program, She Shoots, also helps women understand the important role that the Second Amendment plays in their own personal safety. Benton said, With my background, I know what it is to feel vulnerable, and to be afraid, and to feel like no matter what I do in this moment, as a woman, I cannot outmatch this man. And I don't ever want to feel that way ever again, and I don't want other women feeling that way. Former students of Benton report that they now feel safer in their abilities to protect themselves and that through Benton's guidance, they are safe gun owners. Benton believes that having a female gun instructor to train other women is vital. She said, there's less nervousness and intimidation factor when you're working with someone like me. Female firearms instructors are not very common and it's a real need that I saw that I could help fill. So good on her. I think it is necessary. It's kind of like um, when you go to therapy. Not that I really endorse a lot of the therapy that exists now. Um, They do push a lot of things. Unless you go see like a Christian counselor or something. I don't know. It's up to you. But it just kind of reminds me of like a scenario like that where, where you're trying to find a therapist or a counselor of some sort. And, you know, maybe if you have certain past traumas, you're going to want uh, a male counselor or you're going to want a female counselor, you're going to have a preference, or if you go to the doctor, you're going to want one or the other. I mean, not everybody is picky, but a lot of people are. And so I feel like it makes perfect sense. You know, some women are going to be more comfortable with a woman firearms instructor. So I just, I think it's cool. I think it's a, a very impactful story that Kristen Benton has, but it looks like that's about it, you guys. That's about it for today. Uh, Now, if you like what we're doing here at the Tennessee Conservative and you want us to keep it up, you need to go to our website and hit that red support button. Your donations are what keep us afloat in our little happy conservative boat. I added that last part. It wasn't in the in the in the read. um, So apologies for (laughs) for that cheesy little bit. But while while you're there on our website, okay, hit the subscribe now button to get our free e-newsletter emailed every weekday to your inbox. And be sure to look for our podcast on your favorite platform and leave us a five-star review. Full disclosure, if you don't go leave us a five-star review, I will go home and cry to my mommy. Does that have any impact on your daily life? No. But I, I don't I don't want to cry, and I don't think you guys want me to cry either, so just go leave us a five-star review. Um, Additionally, it does really help us get our message out there. It helps get our content out to more Tennesseans to keep them informed of the truth, to keep them informed of what is really going on in our state. But yeah, as always, your listenership is appreciated. Your readership is appreciated, and we will be back soon with another Big Seven.